Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Gopraith, and I'm the, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at the University of Bath. So it's my first uh, duty to welcome you to the University of Bath. Uh, and I hope that um, either if you're staying at the university or staying in the city, that you're enjoying both. Uh, secondly, I want to welcome you to the UACs conference. Uh, like many of you, uh, this university in, in the Department of Politics, Languages and International Studies has had a long association with UACs, not to mention, uh, in this case, uh, at least two chairs of UACs, most recently with Nick Starton, uh, who's also the head of department of, of that department. Uh, so um, we have an exciting uh, few days. We have an excellent plenary to start us off. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, to speak for about, or, or rather, they're going to speak for about 15 minutes uh, each, uh, and, then, um, and then we'll go to question and answer. Uh, we do have a couple of mics. We will be running back and forth. Because we are being recorded, um, I, I would appreciate it if when you had your question uh, and you'll recognize that you wait until a mic has found you, if you know what I mean, so that you can speak into the mic to be recorded. Um, by all means, if you don't want to be recorded, you can always talk to the uh, individuals of the panel uh, uh, later uh, afterwards. So, um, so again, I, I welcome you to the University of Bath. Um, what we're going to talk about to the day, uh, today is the, uh, the democracy and legitimacy challenge in the future of Europe. We probably could have a three-day conference just on that very issue uh, itself, but we've given you an hour and a half this morning. Um, uh, to do that. Um, we have um, with us three uh, very esteemed uh, uh, speakers. Um, first, we have uh, Gabriella uh, Abels. Um, Gabriella is Professor of Comparative Politics and European Integration at the Institute of Political Science at the University of Tübingen. She is the Director of, uh, of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence Pride. Uh, she has researched and written widely on European integration, regulatory policy making, science and technology studies, uh, uh, which is my own area of interest, uh, democratization of the EU, and especially the role of parliaments uh, in the EU and multi-level parliamentarianism. Uh, she is a former president of the German Association uh, for Political Science. So, welcome. Yeah. Um, next, we have um, Simon Bulmer. Uh, Simon is professor of European politics at the University of Sheffield. Uh, he is recognized for his work on EU governance and EU member states relations and has published widely including books such as the Member States and the European Union, Rethinking Germany and Europe, and the Europeanization of Whitehall. Uh, I wonder what that would be called in its second edition. Or, I mean, anyway, uh, he has been a visiting professor at numerous institutions, including Harvard Center for European Studies, College of Europe, uh, and SWP Think Tank in Germany. Uh, his, uh, he is a member of the editorial board of Parliamentary Studies, uh, of, sorry, Parliamentary Affairs, uh, for those of you like me who've tried to be published there before, and editor of Manchester, uh, Manchester University Press's European Policy Research Series. He, he was elected an act, act an academic uh, of the social sciences and uh, acad acad academician of, this, uh, of, uh, of the Academy of Social Sciences in 2001. Um, finally, we have uh, Shada Islam, who is Director for Europe and Geopolitics at Friends of Europe Think Tank in Brussels. Um, Shada is Visiting Professor at the College of Europe in Natalin where she teaches Asia-Europe relations and a fellow of the Freya Universität Brussels and publishes on migration, EU-Asia relations, amongst other topics. She has been named as one of the 20 most influential women in Brussels by Politico. Uh, uh, Shada is the former Europe com correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review and has previously worked on Asian and migration issues in the European Policy Center. So welcome to all three of you. you. Um, what we've decided is, is that we'll speak uh, kind of uh, from that side down uh, this way. So, uh, Gabriella, over to you. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks uh, all for coming this early time on a Monday morning. And of course, thanks very much for the kind introduction here. And um, well, when we talk about the future of Europe debate and its uh, democratic input, I think it's important, first of all, to uh, consider that we discuss different dimensions of democracy and of democratic legitimacy in particular. And uh, just, to, the, just to quickly remind you that we can, of course, distinguish between input and output legitimacy. And then I think there are good reasons to consider also throughput uh, legitimacy. And this is important uh, to bear in mind 
because I would like to argue that the discussion about democratic legitimacy with regards to the whole future of Europe debate is very much restricted to output legitimacy and the other um, dimensions of democratic legitimacy are pretty much neglected here. Um, when we look at oh, the proposals that are on the table, and when I think of proposals, I mean the uh, white paper on the different, on the five scenarios, uh, the various uh, Juncker Commission president speeches, and uh, proposals by uh, Macron. And um, so these are the most important one, but in addition there are some other number of uh, key po European politicians who made some contributions. I was uh, very happy after a long time of frustration that at some point Angela Merkel, our dear Chancellor, uh, at least um, proposed some ideas or responded to Macron in some way in this uh, interview in the German um, uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung, so, and uh, a number of other uh, people and politicians have made some input into the debate. Nevertheless, I think it's still valid to claim that there is a strong focus on output legitimacy, and um, essentially a number of these proposals are very silent about uh, the institutional design question of the EU. Some of that has to do with the very nature of these proposals, uh, because when you think of the white paper with the different scenarios, it was meant to be an input um, to uh, trigger a wider discussion rather than just coming up with uh, proposals. Nevertheless, it's very silent when you um, look at it with regards to what does it say about legitimacy and uh, democracy, uh, institutional reforms, it's very silent. It's very policy focused and it's interesting on what kind of policy um, there is a focus in this white paper, uh, but nothing about institutional reforms. Um, there is a little bit about uh, in it about um, the expectation uh, capability uh, gap in the EU, uh, often mentioned also in uh, Juncker's speeches, that the EU is expected to do more in this or that way and that it cannot live up to these expectations. So, and that is uh, seen here as a kind of uh, democratic problem, certainly output legitimacy based. Um, so there is a lot of focus on well economic competitiveness, reform of the Eurozone, and that of course has to do with institutional reforms, um, but there is less the question of what it would mean in terms of uh, a more democratic rule of the Eurozone, apart from some ideas spilled out in, in Macron's uh, speeches about a Eurozone uh, parliament. Uh, but nevertheless, there is basically silence about what it would require. Uh, there is a lot about the stronger role of the EU on a global stage, um, particularly with a focus on foreign and defense policy, and we will discuss some of that uh, certainly tomorrow morning at the uh, panel. Um, migration is an issue that comes up uh, in a number of these proposals. Um, but again, it's still the lack of what it would mean for uh, democratic governance of the EU. Um, so this, this brings then about the, the key problem. I mean, if we look at EU democratic legitimacy from an output perspective, um, we do have a number of reasons to doubt that the EU can deliver what it promises, and that is one of the um, key problems for the last number of years that there are a number of promises that have been made uh, which cannot be fulfilled for various reasons. But if you, in the future of Europe debate, have this strong emphasis on output legitimacy but you're not able to deliver, it has uh, repercussions on uh, the perception of democratic legitimacy of the European Union. So I think it's very important to think uh, of democratic legitimacy in this more comprehensive uh, way, um, because then you can think of can stronger forms of input or throughput legitimacy um, balance some of the output legitimacy deficits here. 
Um, and when we think about securing legitimacy in the EU, uh, a key problem that comes up is, of course, uh, the question of the relationship between the member states on the one hand and European institutions on the other hand. And uh, in the whole future of Europe debate, one of the issues that do come up is what kind of sovereignty do we have in mind and what kind of sovereignty is uh, part of these concepts of securing democratic legitimacy, particularly from an output and throughput uh, perspective. And uh, on the one hand, we have, of course, the, the populist right-wing answer, which is going for national sovereignty. I mean, being in Britain, take back control, that is certainly uh, one of the best examples of this kind of discourse. Uh, while on the other hand, we have the more uh, supranationalist uh, voices, certainly uh, what comes up in in Juncker's proposals and certainly uh, President Macron's proposal for uh, European sovereignty, not thinking about sovereignty any longer along national lines, but having a more uh, European supranationalized perspective. Despite the fact, of course, that uh, President Macron does have French national interests also in mind. So the uh, question is really how can we improve then input throughput legitimacy, which I consider are very important in order to have uh, more democratic legitimacy in, in the future uh, Europe. And um, one, one aspect which I think is very important to bear in mind if we think about democracy in the EU, we have uh, to bear in mind the multi-level structure of the European Union. And what is, of course, very um, difficult, what we do see uh, at the moment, or for the last couple of years, really, is a hollowing out of democratic legitimacy of the rule of law in a number of member states. Uh, Poland and Hungary are the most obvious examples, but there are also other member states where we do see these critical developments. And this has repercussions then again on what it would mean for securing EU legitimacy if you think of the EU as a more complex multi-level system. And uh, because this, um, <coughs> uh, when you look at what are the actors who are going for this more nationalist uh, kind of uh, democracy or um, of the sovereignty thinking this, of course, aligns with uh, those member states who try to hollow out, or those govern national governments, I should say, um, democratic rule and rule of law in their own member states. And so there, it's very likely that they have very limited intentions um, to increase the de democratic legitimacy of the European Union as a whole. Um, two aspects for me are very important when we discuss how to improve uh, democratic legitimacy in, in the future uh, Europe. And one is uh, certainly the parliamentary dimension. And when we look at the proposals that are uh, on the table, um, there is some support for that. Um, as I mentioned, um, President Macron's proposal for a, a Parliament for the Eurozone, um, that proposal is no longer on the table. Um, and there is certainly no support for that from, from other member states. There is uh, not really support for that from the German government. But there is some support for uh, strengthening the parliamentary dimension of uh, EU policy making. And when I speak of this parliamentary dimension, I'm not only thinking about the European Parliament. That is, of course, very important, and I'm in favor of a number of proposals. Um, but I think when we think about securing uh, democratic legitimacy for the EU in a parliamentary way, we have to think about more complex designs about how we link parliaments at different levels. So it certainly um, includes uh, the national parliaments with the different chambers and all that. And uh, at least uh, many of you will be aware that there are changes since the Lisbon Treaty, the so-called early warning system and all that. And, uh, but there is still a need for discussion about how these systems can be improved. 
Uh, can there be a more active role for national parliaments? And then coming from a, a federal country and from a country with a strong federal tradition, um, there is also the need to consider uh, the role of regional parliaments because we have more than 70 regional parliaments with legislative competencies in the EU and in, um, it's a question of uh, their role in EU uh, policy making and there are some improvements that have been made in the last uh, couple of years but there is still room for thinking about institutional design here. And I'm certainly not arguing in favor for stronger veto positions for parliaments at various levels, because uh, if you imagine a system with a European parliament, more than 40 uh, national parliaments, plus more than 70 regional parliaments, you would, that would be crazy to have, uh, if all of them would have veto powers. Uh, right, but so it's a question of designing more of a multi-level parliamentary system. And then the second gap which I would um, like to mention, and then I come to the end of my uh, input here, is um, something which is very important also for my work, uh, the complete uh, silence when it comes to the gender regime in the European Union and the gender dimension of the process of European integration. There is nothing on it in the um, various proposals. And like when you look at uh, Juncker's speech, uh, State of the Union address, uh, he's speaking about equality. And when he's speaking about equality, he's thinking about non-discrimination based on uh, nationality. And uh, think, uh, speaking about that uh, there should be like the same access to measles infection, uh, infection in the Eastern European countries, uh, but it's there is complete silence when it comes to the uh, massive uh, gender imbalances that we do see, still still see in a number of member states and uh, social, economic, political uh, field. So um, I would uh, certainly argue if we think about a more democratic uh, future for the European Union, we have to uh, mainstream the dimension of uh, a gender here and um, we, we, we cannot leave out uh, that dimension because uh, if we speak of an inclusive democracy, we certainly have to take these issues into account. And I stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Simon Bournes. So please, Simon, over to you. Uh, hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, the way I've come at this issue, which uh, has been a long one, dating back, I can remember it being discussed when I was an undergraduate student, the legit mm -hmm. legitimacy of the European Union. Uh, was to go back and have a look at one of the, uh, for me, the classics on legitimacy in the EU uh, by David Beetham and uh, Chris Lord. And I think what I'm going to do that's slightly different from what Gabriella is, uh, has just spoken about is talk more about the normative side of legitimacy rather than the analytical, the, the more mechanical way of, uh, of looking at it and just try and reflect on some of the uh, impact of the crisis, the post-mastery period on EU legitimacy to underline the challenge that lies ahead. And I'll say rather less than Gabriella did about the, the specific proposals uh, for the future of Europe, rather focusing on some considerations. So uh, the... Um, <clears throat> way of understanding legitimacy looking at uh, their work is threefold in a normative sense. A rule has to be legitimate, it has to comply with rules and laws, so rules. It must command support as the rightful source of authority. So this is where beliefs come in, and this is where I'm going to focus uh, greatly on citizens' orientations towards uh, the EU, and it's in this aspect that I think uh, the EU has taken a significant knock in recent times. And rule also needs consent uh, through processes of legitimation, which is what I think we've been talking about uh, just uh, now. 
We need to remember with legitimacy about uh, the need to get EU and its member states in synchronisation uh, because the EU is not uh, a state and if the member states are in conflict with the EU that can weaken the legitimacy of the EU in the eyes of the citizens of that state. And I think that's uh, significant with some states like Italy now uh, uh, with a more Eurosceptic uh, government. So focusing on the beliefs, I sort of had a flashback to, does anybody remember the Adonino report? Mm -hmm. um, 1984 to promote a people's Europe, whatever happened to that? Well, some of the ideas were indeed put <coughs> into practice. Maybe now it's even too controversial to think of having such a report, but actually in a way uh, we probably need to, well, the EU needs to uh, revisit that. Um, beliefs and attitudes towards the EU are always more difficult during crises, <coughs> economic downturns than during fair weather conditions because governments find it more difficult to reach a consensus and there's always been the uh, problem of making the EU's political system comprehensible to citizens resulting or contributing to the sort of long-term decline in turnout for European Parliament elections. I think um, <coughs> we need also to think about the post-Maastricht period and the impact it's had on uh, beliefs. It's led to some reflection on theorising on the EU, the new intergovernmentalism, uh, for instance. But the first thing that strikes me about it, and it engages with the uh, work of Philip Genschel and Marcus Jachtenfuss Fuchs is about how the EU got involved in core state powers, migration and money, these kinds of issues, uh, taking the EU beyond a regulatory polity and what could perhaps be regarded as a stable uh, institutional equilibrium, bringing out those conflicts that led to uh, the UK in particular having opt-outs, introducing differentiated integration. We just heard about the uh, Parliament for the Eurozone. It'd be interesting to know what impact differentiated integration has on citizens' mm -hmm. understandings and beliefs about the EU, because it all becomes more fuzzy, more complicated. But it wasn't just, of course, in the UK where concerns about uh, democratic legitimacy were aired in in Germany, the Federal Constitutional Courts, Maastricht and Lisbon rulings question the sort of boundaries between the EU and the member states and requiring explicit democratic legitimation by the German Parliament of further steps towards European statehood, if we want to call it that, such as the introduction of the single currency, uh, of using simplified treaty reform procedures and so on. So perhaps there we have a clearer idea of trying to define those boundaries than, than perhaps in other states. And then we have the public response. Uh, it's in the post-Maastricht period where we've had the intermittent uh, referendum results that have set back uh, constitutional reforms, the Maastricht Treaty, the Constitutional Treaty, of course, the Irish referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, the EU brought into much more uh, political contestation. And if we think of the work that Gary Marx and uh, Elizabeth Hugo and Gary Marx have done on uh, the decline of the permissive consensus, uh, turning it towards a constraining consensus in their work on post-functionalism, we can see one expression of that. And it's found uh, expression in, in other literatures, uh, the politicisation literature of de Wilder and, and others, highlighting how the salience of the EU has increased in member state politics, has become more polarised and has drawn in increasing numbers of actors and audiences. And the post -lit, po going back to the post-functionalism literature, I think that's highlighted uh, another development that's uh, particularly evident in the 
very recent uh, Hooger and Marx article uh, in a special issue of JEP, uh, where they have identified the emergence of a transnational cleavage that has as its focal point the defence of national, political, social and economic ways of life against external actors who penetrate the state by migrating, exchanging goods or exerting rule. So um, that was a quote, of course. So that's alluding to Euroscepticism that's risen across the EU in different forms, in different states, and perhaps where the um, rise of it in Italy and Germany is particularly concerning. Obviously, in Italy, it's different because there's a popular right government, but <laughs> Salvini is uh, making his voice known on the international stage, grabbing headlines through seeking alliances with Hungary, Austria, even the CSU Interior Ministry, Minister Zehofer in, in Germany. Uh, in the case of Germany, it's less, at the moment, the scale of Euroscepticism, and more the fact that we're talking about the state that's probably the most influential in the EU, and that the emergence of the AFD has weakened the ability to form a coalition, um, has divided the party system, uh, that is one of the effects of the emergence of this transnational cleavage, that it makes issues more contested, and if pro-European parties become more defensive, then who's making the case for the EU? Five minutes, okay. So, uh, the growth of the Euroskeptic, Euroskepticism has obviously come about uh, prompted by the Eurozone crisis. Uh, I think we know enough uh, uh, about that, uh, the Eurozone crisis, which was salient on the side of both uh, the, the um, debtor states and also the creditor states, where the uh, funding of the debt was uh, contested. It was the origin of the AFD in Germany, for instance. Uh, and also gave rise to the concerns about a German uh, dominance in the European Union. Whereas the migration crisis has played straight into the transnational cleavage identified uh, by Huger and Marx. So these are real crises that uh, we need to be aware of and which are weakening, I feel, the traditional pro-European coalitions. It took uh, five months to build a federal coalition in Germany and then I think it was nine months before the Meseberg Agreement addressing Macron's uh, proposals on the Eurozone. So we can see that it's having a, a kind of debilitating effect. We mustn't omit the rule of law crisis in Hungary and Poland, and we can hardly expect any help from Putin or uh, Donald J. Trump. So what are the implications of this? Summing up a, a picture of doom and gloom, a long charge sheet, if you like, against the EU. Uh, I think it's time for some kind of reflection on the part of European political leaders to think about where the EU is going. I'm not talking about specific proposals like Macron, but a vision around engaging citizens and bringing those beliefs closer back to Europe. By contrast, if the future Europe debate is too focused on institutional engineering, I think that will not have that uh, effect. Uh, I think academics can play a part. Uh, I suppose a classic case of this was Simon Hicks's book, What's Wrong with the EU and How to Fix It, uh, which gave us, or prompted the Spitzenkandidat uh, debate, and he saw political conflict over the EU as a good thing. I'm not sure whether that's still quite how we would uh, see things, but the point was he was prepared to <laughs> put his neck out and diagnose what the problems of the EU were and suggest a way forward. And I think this 
sort of thing is going to be necessary and if there's some hiccups in the trial and error of experimentation, so be it. Just something briefly on Macron. It will be um, a bit controversial, but I think the idea of some rebalancing on Eurozone governance has probably got to be better for cohesion in the EU. And cohesion in the EU is something that's going to bring people's beliefs uh, back around uh, uh, the EU. And of course the European elections lie ahead uh, and uh, that's going to be an important first test for whether the mm -hmm. more centrist European parties are going to be able to try and put forward a vision that citizens uh, can engage with. It's a bit odd sort of reflecting on these things when we're when I am expecting not to be in the EU when this debate mm -hmm. really uh, gets going. But uh, for those of you who are non-Brits, uh, if we're outside the EU, there'll be a whole different paper on legitimacy of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, Shalom, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to try and bring to you what uh, think tanks like Friends of Europe is thinking about and uh, would like to see in this new era of European fragility and uh, weaknesses that I'm going to sketch out for you. I'm going to take a, a position which is uh, more practical, I think, and, you know, we're in the midst of a very dramatic moment. And, you know, Gabriella and, and Simon have pointed out to the many challenges that we face. Uh, it's going to get worse. It's going to get very difficult, very troubled in the days ahead, the months ahead, and perhaps also the years ahead. And as uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the European Commission President, goes to the European Parliament on the September the 12th to sketch out his uh, his ideas for the future, he's got just about a year to go, even less, he's very interested in legacy issues. But what are the fundamental fault lines that are running across Europe at the moment and that we are, are very much part of the debate on? Now obviously, uh, Gabriela and Sa Simon have talked about the different challenges. Let me just give you a little bit of my, uh, my feeling about it. So Brexit is obviously going to dominate, and whether it's a sane Brexit, an insane Brexit, a deal or a no-deal Brexit, it's going to get very complicated and very acrimonious. And that is going to be a distraction for the European Union from looking at the essential uh, crisis and challenges that we face. There's no doubt about it. Uh, whether we like it or not, Donald Trump, uh, whether he's in, in a moody state of mind, whether he's magnanimous, it's still going to, he's still going to loom very large over the European landscape. He, he is on many issues, whether it's trade, whether it's defense, uh, whether it's Iran. Uh, we've got elections to the European Parliament, and Simon has talked about how we really need to get the voters out there to vote for Europe. Before we do that, we have to connect with the citizens and explain to them why this vote is going to be so important. We've got appointments coming up for Juncker, uh, for Donald Tusk, the EU Council uh, President. We've got new commissioners uh, going to be appointed by all the governments. There's going to be a lot of horse trading and haggling. And how much of that horse trading and haggling is going to, be, uh, is going to re really resonate uh, and echo with citizens? Or is it going to be more of the same, same old, same old? Of course, we have also uh, challenges of immigration. I don't like to call it a crisis. It is not a crisis. It is the way the European leadership is responding to this challenge that has turned into a crisis. We have, of course, populism, and of course, Simon has talked about it. I'll go into it a little bit more in detail. Uh, and obviously, we've got some very good ideas out there about Eurozone reform, defense cooperation, about uh, rule of law provisions. We've got that, right? And, and it's interesting. It's good, it's, but it's just tinkering at the edges. It's not really going to the crunch of the issues of the disaffection and the disconnect that European citizens, citizens are feeling when it comes to Europe. 
Um, we've also got, of course, and you know, this is another topic, relations with China, Russian meddling, uh, what do we do with Turkey, what do we do with Iran? All of these issues are going to dominate. So it's going to get very, very complex and very complicated in the coming, in the coming days. And our values and our democracy, our, our, our commitment to the rule of law, which really is essential uh, for Europe to, to thrive, uh, are being tested and will continue to be tested in many ways. Is our leadership ready and able to deal with these different facets of, the, of, of challenges? I don't think so. They're not yet. And I think that's one of the key issues that is really uh, energizing European citizens because whether we notice it or not, you know, we're all focused on the Salvinis and the, and the IFT and, you know, um, Geert Wilders and all the rest of it and Brexit. But what's really interesting, and I think this is something that we really want to highlight as Friends of Europe, is the civic engagement that is coming out. We don't talk about it very much. There's not enough information about it. We tend to be our media. I used to be a journalist focuses very much on the, you know, the extremists' points of view that are out there. It's kind of a natural instinct for journalists. That's what get the headline, gets the headlines. But if you look around Europe, and not just at Pulse Europe or civic engagement movements, but in every town, every city, every region, Europe is in everyone's mind. And as Bono, before he lost his voice, poor man, uh, a, few days, a few days ago pointed out, you know, this is no longer a yawn-inducing exercise. This has really turned into a kitchen table screaming match. And, and that is something I think that is new, unusual for Europe, right? It was a big yawn, let's be quite frank. Uh, but that hasn't been capitalized by our leadership. By, by, by the people in Brussels, but also not by, by national leaders. So I think our citizens, Europeans, whether they're in Britain or on the continent, are really searching for a conversation uh, about important issues for them. And that is immigration, that is security, that is the future of Europe, but we're not engaging with them. The European Union institutional structure uh, you know, is still very much based on the way things used to be. They're not taking into account new powers, horizontal networks, citizens' networks, discussions that are taking place. Um, you know, they, they engage on a very superficial level. We are consulted, all of us are consulted before there's, you know, the, the white papers and the green papers and all of that. It's a ritualistic consultation, I'm afraid. The one point that was made recently uh, over summertime when there was a real consultation. There was an energetic and enthusiastic response from citizens. I think over four million people actually um, reacted, responded, and there was a kind of a consensus that we need to get rid of summertime and the commission's going to come up with the proposal. You know, that's the kind of innovative, maybe, maybe just minor issues for some but still a, a, a way forward for consultations to be really important. So, you know, in the past, we may have talked about the legitimacy and the democracy, uh, democratic credentials of EU institutions. Today, it's about the substance of democracy. Can European democracy thrive in the days ahead? So, um, you know, the European institutions are aware of these challenges. My only concern is that they're not really responding. The debate on Europe, dear friends, has been absolutely hijacked by the populists and the Eurosceptics. We have abdicated any ownership of it. They are setting the agenda, and they are dictating the terms of the conversation, whether it's on populism, whether it's on immigration, whether it's on Islam, uh, whether it's uh, about Semit Semitic, anti-Semitic or not, they have taken over an agenda and European leaders of all kinds really have abdicated their responsibility. Uh, so when I, when I look at Europe today, I mean, I think there are really four crunch issues that have to be uh, articulated and discussed uh, in public before we can start talking about new initiatives and reform proposals, before they, those proposals, become credible. So that there's a crisis of disconnect, and I, you know, I've referred to it, uh, Gabriela and Simon have referred to it, there really is a dis disconnect between 
leadership and citizens. It's not just the political parties. Political parties have actually become so entangled in tribal, debilitating tribal debates that they're not really looking to answer or respond to any of the citizens' concerns. I mean, you in Britain know that even more than, than we do on the continent. There's a disconnect. The civic engagement that some of us have written about, Richard Youngs of Carnegie has done an excellent <laughs> book about how this civil uh, enthusiasm discussion can be brought into the mainstream structures of the European Union. He's here, uh, I think, in the coming days, and do interrogate him about it because he said some really, really interesting things about how the silo system can be broken and we can get the public involved uh, through a second chamber in the European Parliament. That kind of you know, root and branch reform, uh, we're not there yet because we're fighting fires all the time. So we're losing sight of the bigger picture. So that's the, that's the crisis of disconnect. There's a crisis of leadership, and I've referred to that. You know, It's the drip, 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 the daily toxic messages that we're receiving on issues of immigration, refugees, Islam, Judaism, whatever. It's the drip that's making people numb and, 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 you know, and, and the unacceptable things are becoming normalized. This is not a Europe I recognize, frankly, and I, and I worry about that. And, and, and just a word, you know, we're here and we're talking amongst ourselves and you know, we're all sort of uh, worried about the future of Europe. The world is watching too. And, any influence that we had, whether it came to the Rohingya crisis or the Palestinians or the Afghanistan war, etc., we could lose because inside our own home we're not capable of dealing with some of the rule of law, democracy, human rights issues that have come up. Yes. Um, so there's also, uh, I, I'll speed up, there's also the crisis of purpose and uh, who are we? Why are we here? Uh, are we here to uh, just be transactional uh, partners? It's all about getting trade uh, benefits. That's the highlight of uh, Brexit at the moment. Uh, or is it more about solidarity, defense of values, etc.? I don't know. What's it going to be? Uh, it's also a crisis of, uh, of, of direction. Um, Gabriela referred to the different white papers that Juncker has brought out. The debate is still out there. No one's really discussed it. Are we actually going for the kind of giver of start uh, European Union, you know, Euro, uh, Federation of, European, uh, of the European Union, or are we going to still be in a kind of a flexible arrangement, multi-speed, pluri-speed? We don't know that. Those issues, I think this is the right time to talk about them. Okay, so uh, what are my suggestions? And these are very humble suggestions, but something that we uh, at Friends of Europe are, are really pushing uh, very hard on. We have to get some really serious discussion about, as I said, European values. I think ideally if Juncker would at least come out and not just leave it to Franz Timmermans, the only man inside the European institutions that's taking a vocal point on some of our fundamental values, rule of law, daring to go against the trend um, in, 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 in councils of ministers. He's the lone voice, and that cannot be allowed. I mean, I'm sorry, but this is something that is shameful uh, in, in Europe. So I think what Juncker, what I would like him to do, is not going to do it, uh, uh, I don't think. Um, it's going to be about uh, reaffirming our values, what we stand for, who are we in this world. We're actually at the moment, let's be quite frank, we're about the only voice of reason. In some areas, we are only a uh, voice uh, that, that matters at the moment. Um, and then let's not beat around the bush. We need to get the migration issue sorted. We need to get it sorted once again. This is not going to be just done in the next few days, obviously not. We can't just tinker on the edges like that. We need to have a real discussion about reforming a system that is completely out of date, broken, uh, that needs a global uh, response as well. But we need to start having that discussion. We need to be very frank with our citizens where we're not, European leaders are not, um, that you know they're embracing, the mainstream politicians have embraced the far right rhetoric. Uh, and we need to get the migration issue also uh, sorted. I'd like to also talk about uh, inclusion, inclusive leadership. The heroes that we have at the moment, the only I see, we see uh, in Brussels, the only men and women who are actually talking sense in terms of what Europe is today and what Europe's aspirations are, are local leaders. 
are the mayors of some cities, are, are, are leaders in, 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 in the regions, etc. They are the voices of actually engagement with citizens, but also talking sense to power, talking truth to power. But inclusion is also about gender, but also about ethnic diversity. Now, our governments across Europe are reflecting the diversity of its citizenship, of their citizens, of their nationals, um, but not the EU institutions. I'm afraid they're absolutely not. It's all the same old template that's being repeated over and over again. And I really worry about it, because if we're going to get Europeans engaged in this magnificent exercise that is Europe, firm believer, passionate believer in the European Union, um, we really need to become more inclu inclusive. Without that, it's not going to work. And finally, you know, uh, we have become used to people calling media the enemy of the people. We've become used to leaders demonizing the media. It's just par for the course, you know. Um, we have to stop that. We have to make that stop. Without a credible, independent, and free press, you know, Europe's democracy, legitimacy is not going to survive. We have to be able to do that. And journalists have to take on the real, real responsibility uh, of talking truth to power, asking the right questions. I'm a former journalist, I can tell you, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see how some of that will has been broken. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, that's sort of the kind of issues I think that's important. The European Parliament elections are going to be about the future of Europe. And I think the more we can energize people, everyone, uh, to, to actually come out and vote, but before that, have told them that our future depends on it, on what happens there, the better it will, I think, be for all of us. Thank you, David. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to open the floor. As I said, we have two mics, uh, and we, we have uh, these uh, very thankful uh, two individuals who are, are going to help us with the mics. Um, and, uh, and again, just let me repeat, um, if, if you do have a question, wait for the mic to come to you so that we can record, actually, your, uh, your question so we can hear the whole conversation. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we group uh, the questions so that we can make sure that we can get to everyone's questions uh, within the, uh, the 35 minutes that are, are, are left to us. So over to you. Please. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. I really enjoyed that. And uh, thank you for depressing us so much. Um, <laughs> my name, my name, so early in the morning, that's right. My name's Philomena Murray from the University of Melbourne. So I'm a European Europeanist and an Australian Europeanist. Um, and I see it from both sides. And it is uh, one of the challenges is that um, the impact of the EU in other parts of the world is being noticed. There is a tremendous sense of the Brussels bubble still in many parts of academia as well as in the institutional setup of the European Union in Brussels. And um, one of the challenges when I speak with um, officials and I talk to them about the refugee crisis and I get calmly told that the refugee crisis is over, which, which is terrific news to those of us who are still worried about it. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges, the defensiveness of many officials at certain parts of the European uh, Union, while others are tremendously frank and absolutely so honest, it's refreshing. I mean, how do we deal with this? I mean, one of the ways we deal with it is we allow loyal and disloyal contestation because contestation has been taken over by Euroscepticism. And we, we already have up something like 25% of the European Parliament that is Eurosceptic or populist or both. This is going to go up to 50% if it continues like this. So I'd like to ask our um, very, um, Im very important panel, how are we going to actually bring about this? Could it be a rethinking of the peace narrative as a narrative of inclusion, as a narrative of multiculturalism and a narrative of tolerance? Because, hey, guess what? That's what I'm suggesting. But I'd like to get your, your feedback on this. So it's really about loyal and disloyal contestation, but it's really about rethinking that peace narrative to make it actually relevant to us now uh, because we need to actually hang on to it, but in that different way. Thank you. Do we have any other questions to take with that one? 
Yes, please. Yes, sorry. It's <laughs> Carpen Hubbard, Newcastle University. Probably an intruder here because I'm an agriculture economist invited to talk about Brexit uh, and agriculture policy. Can you hear me? Uh, so my question is about um, uh, what is the role of what role? should politicians play, uh, play across the European Union? And, but I have to give you just a short context. Last week, uh, Boris Johnson just published in, Daily, in the Daily Telegraph, of course, something about Brexit, but he used uh, the case of Greece um, in comparison with the UK, which I thought, of course, was absolutely inappropriate. And he talked about the EU and Greece as a colony so he said, is the colonization of Greece. And of course, that's what his point about, you know, the UK also becoming um, a colony. And I wonder, in this case, if we talk about colonies across Europe, because this is the feeling also on some of the Central and Eastern European countries, what role in this case politicians should play across the entire Euro European Union? Any Another question. Well, I, I'm going to ask a question if, uh, if we don't have a third question, and maybe we'll return to the panel. Oh, yeah, we do have a question. Sorry. I'll save my question. Yeah. yeah. I think it's over. I think they're all. Yeah. They're all. Thank you, Bronwyn Winter, University of Sydney. So another European is based in Australia, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, in this talk of legitimacy and shadow, I was particularly interested in what you said about uh, mayors and local government and uh, disconnect from citizens. I don't think the EU has ever really been connected with citizens, but that's another conversation. But I'm actually interested in social Europe, because if we're thinking about what European citizens are concerned about, they're concerned about job <coughs> security, they're concerned about housing, they're concerned about cost of living. Uh, yes, and the populist right has hijacked the agenda to blame these things on problems of security and immigration and so on, the stories we know. but. I would like the panel to talk about social Europe and the disjuncture, the mismatch between the original reason the EU was formed, which was purely economic and trade, and this new narrative that's now coming along of democracy, human rights, and the law, rule of law. But we don't really talk very much about social Europe. And that's where Europeans are living. So I would be very interested in hearing some comment on that. <coughs> Okay, yes, maybe I can take up some of the issues being raised. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I start with, with the last one because I think this idea about, uh, well, I'm very much in favor of more social Europe for a number of reasons. Um, being interested in gender relations is part of that. Uh, but of course, that is linked to the whole institutional designs, the governance structures, um, sharing of competencies uh, between member states and the European Union itself. Um, and what we often do see, I think, that people do expect way too much from the European Union because there is a lack of knowledge about who is responsible for what kind of issues, uh, where are competences and on what, which levels. And this is creating then sometimes way too high expectations. And that is um, uh, to some extent uh, a question of, of, of knowledge and we need more communication about that. We need more information because there is certainly a number of people are not aware about who's in charge for what and that has to do with a lot of politicians behaving in an irresponsible way because they often do, we all know that uh, these uh, blame shifting games, whatever comes from Brussels uh, that is just uh, bad and if something works well, uh, then it's uh, the national government or regional government or whatever. Um, so I, I think that is very important to have more information so that citizens are more capable of um, assessing who's in, in, in charge of that. But I 
I'm very aware that there are clear limitations because the system is so complex and to communicate it. But this links, I think, also to the question of standards uh, in terms of um, what do people expect from the European level, what they may not expect from the national level. Because if you ask people on the streets in Germany, how does German federalism work? Uh, they know nothing about it, but they expect to uh, be informed about the European Union, even if they don't inform themselves and of, do not feel sufficiently informed about German federalism. So it's often a question of standard, and I think that's something that we have to bear in mind. And while as academics, we have to put a lot of effort in um, helping people to get more knowledgeable about the EU, but at the same time, we need to be aware of the clear limitations that are there in place due to the very complex nature of, of the issue itself. Um, yeah, so that maybe takes already into account some of the questions asked by the other two speakers. Right. Well, uh, really good questions. Um, difficult uh, <laughs> to give coherent answers, but I, I think the the thing that I would emphasize, I mean, I think social cohesion has got to be reinforced. One of the difficulties, I suppose, is that social democracy is in its own difficulties, mm -hmm. so that the kind of left-right axis is in, has been imbalanced of late. And then we have this identity cleavage on top of that, where we're hearing, as you uh, articulated it, Shadow, that, that, that the Eurosceptics are making the running and the case is not being made for multi-leveled identities, for the benefits of European solidarity and member state identity and subnational identity, gender identities and all these sorts of things. I mean, we can't leave that to Jürgen Habermas. We've got to have politicians uh, taking uh, mm -hmm. the, the lead on that. That sounds very idealistic, I know, but, you know, the alternative is the argument simply goes by the wayside. Um, and just one other observation, I mean, I know this debate has got to be conducted in a uh, different context from the 2016 referendum, but, but in a way the experience of the referendum and the aftermath of it right up to the present should be something that those who are devising their strategies in trying to combat these views take seriously into account because it is a kind of, has been a kind of dummy run at uh, this kind of mm -hmm. contestation, if not a very successful model uh, to be followed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I'll start with Philo's question. Uh, you're absolutely right, Philo, about saying, you know, you will hear now in Brussels and maybe some other capitals, the refugee crisis is over. Um, you'll hear that. Uh, in, indeed, numbers are down, but the hysteria around the issue hasn't gone away. And the focus, if you look at what's happening in Sweden with the Sweden Democrats, is now moving from the incoming, you know, the, the, the challenge of dealing with the newcomers, the refugees who are coming into the issue, which I think is the very correct issue to focus on, not just in the way the Sweet, Sweden Democrats are doing it, integration, inclusion, integration of the people who are already here, uh, and, and with a special reference, obviously, to Islam, and the, the inherent sort of belief that, you know, we don't articulate in civilized uh, circles, but that Islam is somehow incompatible with the integration process of Europe, that Muslims can't be Europeans, so that old chestnut. So that, that's the kind of easy answer that the Europeans will say, well, numbers are down, so we don't really have a challenge there anymore. Let's get on with the real business of Europe. Sorry, that is the real business of Europe. Uh, the future of Europe and democracy in Europe is going to depend on how inclusive European societies are and how we can facilitate, speed up uh, the integration, uh, inclusion process. A lot has been written about it. We know that there are certain inherent things that have to change, allowing people to work as soon as they come in. Uh, you know, creating uh, job opportunities, there's, there's, there's a whole list of things to be done. Um, but, you know, we're not tackling that. We're not tackling that. I think what sometimes worries me is our EU institutions, yeah, you know, we, we know they live in a bubble, uh, but they behave as though 
like there's Europe and then there's Brussels and the EU. And you know, the decisions that are taken here in, in the EU, and that's what national politicians do as well, sort of you take those decisions in, in the EU, in Brussels, and then that's it, you know. The rest of it is, is, is not their problem. I think, seriously, after the Brexit experience, um, the EU should stop behaving like a state and become more of a partnership with member states. When there is a challenge, when there's a crisis in, in a national government, European commissioners, European parliamentarians, whether they're German, Greek, whatever, should be part of the conversation. That's how you create a sense of being European, not just being in silos. It doesn't mean meddling, it doesn't mean interfering, but we're part of the same space. And we face the same challenges in this globalized world. We cannot just, and when it comes to the crunch on issues that are vital to our future, create that silo. And then, you know, have a regulatory framework designed for finance. Yes, we have business decisions being taken with great regulatory power. But when it comes to beyond regulatory, when it comes to rights and values and rule of law, we then go back into our little uh, pigeonholes and say that's not our issue. We can't meddle. And that's a myth. I think that European um, politicians like our Boris Johnson, when he talks about colony and the rest of it, that's what he's pushing, you know, he's pushing that <coughs> further. So I think that that's something that we actually have to re rewrite as well. Um, on all social Europe, I, I do agree with you. It tends to fall off the agenda and then often, uh, as the European institutions do, they bring it back in, they add it on, you know, it's an afterthought. Everyone knows it's an afterthought, but it's there. Uh, to console us, and I think that needs to change as well. So I know I'm being rather idealistic, but I think we're at a crunch moment. If we don't go in for certain very serious, deep-reaching thinking and reflecting, not just you know going back to the 60th anniversary and rewriting the, 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 the de declaration, where you know that's not it. I think we really need to work beyond that. All right. Um, you know, my very first uh, UACS conference was in Zagreb uh, back in 2007, I think it was. I can't remember. Somebody may remember. And uh, one of the interesting things was that uh, there was a plenary, and it was on uh, European or, or democracy, EU democracy, legitimacy. It was very much kind of framed around very similar. And, and as I mean, the others have always already said, this is a long going debate. And what's interesting is, is how much actually nothing's really changed in that debate. Now, of course, you know, 2007 is not that long ago. But of course, we imagine that things have radically, some things have radically changed during that time, not to mention uh, Brexit. And um, the, um, the, the, um, the discussion about uh, whether or not uh, can we expect the EU to be something more than it is uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of its relationship with its citizens uh, has always been, uh, as an American living here, uh, a, a very bizarre thing uh, to me. Uh, because actually, in many cases, citizens of national governments don't expect national governments to act that way. And so there's a double standard that's being, um, uh, that's being applied there, which I think has been highlighted here. But the other thing is, is how much um, actually is, when we get down to the nitty gritty around uh, how does the EU engage with its citizens, you know, how does it have a real impact on, on, uh, on, 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 uh, on individual lives, on, on the, on the, the, the um, you know, on the, the role of women, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, you know, the, the issues that we share uh, around cross-border uh, trade, on the issues around uh, what's the future of European defense uh, with or without NATO, uh, what's the relationship, future relationship with, uh, with uh, North Africa and the Middle East, um, you know, the, these are all things that actually, um, as said, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of good ideas about. But actually, none of us can really see how any of those ideas can can actually be uh, implemented in, in any way. Uh, although that we do see a lot of people kind of working towards some kind of direction. So my question was going to be largely, where does leadership? Where do we see leadership coming from in the future? And if we look back, you know, and, and, you know, Simon Hicks and, you know, and the awkward partners and, and so on, there's this constant reference to the Franco-German axis as being a driver of European integration or, or European reform or European or, or EU, uh, EU uh, futures. Uh, and of course, uh, we've heard um, some discussion around uh, Merkel and Macron. Uh, here today, but uh, so my question is: is where is that where is that leadership going to come? 
And uh, may we be so bold as to assume that actually that the EU has gotten so large that actually it's impossible for a, a Franco-German access to really have a leadership role or, or actually any country uh, or set of countries to have a leadership role in Europe today. And that is the fundamental problem uh, of, um, of, a, of, a, um, of, in many cases, what is a post-war uh, a post-war settlement, uh, EU and Europe. Any other questions to go with that, please? Oh, sorry, there's uh, two, two, yeah. Hi, Terry Givens. And um, what disturbs me al along with the, and I think this ties into your question, is the timidity which Europe has approached the situation in uh, Poland and Hungary and that it really undermines the, the legitimacy of the EU because we're in a situation where there's the crisis in the Middle East, which is of course fueling the refugee situation, and that there's a real lack of leadership, not coming of course from the US, but also from the EU and European leaders in these areas. And so I think that, well, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, can there be real, democratic legitimacy when the EU isn't even dealing, this was already raised before, but I'd like to hear you guys address this again. Can there be real democratic legitimacy when the EU isn't even facing it in, within the EU itself? Mm -hmm. And there was one question just, just below. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, very impressive contributions from Could our you speakers. Okay, very impressive contributions. I'm sure all of, all of us felt that from our speakers. Um, but the discussion now has moved on to the question of leadership and where is that going to come from and what structures could it fit into. And I think there are four very simple headings, as it were, under which to look at the issues of leadership. And if I may preface my question with a very brief historical message about these. The first is obviously what values are we leading for? And I think broadly speaking, there's a consensus around what the European values should be. How well they're interpreted at the moment in our particular policies is an open question. But nonetheless, the overall values are there. They've sat there, broadly speaking, since the creation of the Council of Europe, even before the creation of the EU. And broadly speaking, that's the network, if you like, to which the EU itself has referred. Secondly lie then the interests that we're promoting through what our actions are to be. Uh, those become clearer and clearer, in particular through the Brexit debate. We see how intertwined these interests now are, which many people, certainly in the popular imagination, mm -hmm. still thought there were national economies. Uh, that perhaps is a bit of an overstatement of the case, <laughs> but it is questionable now how important the national economies are. But then it comes down to also the question of numbers. And there is a history inside the EU about where to look for leadership. And it came to a head under de Gaulle. And de Gaulle promoted uh, the Fouché plan, which we haven't mentioned, but nonetheless must be alive in many people's minds, which was essentially that three nations within then the, the European communities, uh, France, Germany, and Italy, would lead and they would lead in a structure which subordinated Brussels beneath a political structure. Gradually, Pompidou moved towards the idea there should be four leaders. That would include the UK. But that got tangled up in internal policies and very quickly was dropped, largely against the opposition coming from the smaller states. Not surprisingly, enlargement has made a return to that idea both more attractive in one sense, because enlargement dealing with 28 states is even more impossible than it was with 9, 12, 15, as we moved on and as the numbers went up. That was the rationale for de Gaulle saying, let's lead with big states rather than bother about the small ones. They will have to follow where the big ones lead. That question is sub subtext, I think, in some of the discussions that are underway now and what came out from Paris a matter of the, less than a year ago. Uh, and the final one is, in fact, uh, what sort of structures should you bind this into? And uh, the, the opposition between binding it into the way, you, the way Brussels works, i.e. the EU or any other, has largely been solved in favor of Brussels. But I think suddenly the question is there again, is there another structure that isn't actually Brussels that is going to lead when we put Europe together finally? So Martin Vaughan, Regents. Uh, University of London, right, yeah. So uh, there was a, one question here, uh, sorry, just in, in the middle. Yeah, keep going, keep going, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Um, Anna Lodonskoy from the citizen led organization of 3 million. Um, when we talk about the juncture and um, the democracy uh, legitimacy, we also need to think about democratic uh, uh, deficit. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about how I was brought up. I was brought up in the middle of nowhere in the 1960s in northern France. By the time I left primary school, I knew about the basics of how the French state worked. Um, when I moved to secondary school in 1972, then 1973, um, the UK uh, joined the EU. And I built my knowledge on this. It was part of the curriculum. Europe was part of the curriculum. I also had a granddad who fought in World War I and World War II. And he was extremely in favor of Europe because that, for him, was the only way to stop another war. And although he was critical of it, we talked about it as a family. We talked about, you talked about kitchen table conversations. This was part of my upbringing. And when I talked to um, colleagues and friends um, who were brought up about the same time as me in the UK, they didn't have that education around Europe. And I think Europe also starts at school. It doesn't just start at policy level. It doesn't start at national or Brussels levels. It starts at school. It starts at part of um, people's education. So I was wondering what you thought of that. Mm. Yeah, great. OK. If there are no further questions, we'll turn to the panel for those, please. Okay, yeah, okay. I um, start then. Right, uh, the, the question of uh, EU's response to um, the dramatic decline in rule of law in a number of member states, and as I said, Poland and Hungary are just key examples, but what we do see in Italy at the moment, uh, uh, Romania, when you think about uh, corruption, uh, these kinds. So it, it is an issue in a number of of uh, member states, and I th think I agree with what uh, Shada um, said in her initial uh, intervention that it's a shame that uh, Timmermans in the Commission is one of the uh, only people who really has an outspoken position, and I would expect a lot more national governments to speak out against it. Like I would. Like, for, for the German, it's always a little bit problematic, particularly when it comes to Poland and Hungary, right, to tell the Polish what to do, because we are really good in telling others, uh, do your homeworks. So for historical reasons, that's a bit problematic here. But I would love to see the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian governments tell them, because they have a strong human rights record. They have a very good... Um, uh, rule of law record that they would be much more outspoken towards Hungarians, Poland, uh, so on and so forth, and uh, take a, uh, a statement here, make a statement. Um, secondly, what I think could be promising, there is at least some ideas uh, in the room that uh, maybe there should be um, more conditionality evaluations um, on all member states uh, on a more permanent basis. That it's because we know or know conditionality is very strong, and once you are in the union, uh, then there is uh, no such thing as conditionality. Even if you have a bad record, it's very very difficult to uh, make use of Article Seven and all that. So that. So far, this has uh, no consequence, really. So I would like to, to use the Commission, uh, make more use of the instruments that it has to be, well, given the Court of Justice, uh, make more use of, of speeches, also more governments, but also that we do think about um, some kind of assessment uh, so that it doesn't look like scapegoating these countries with a particularly bad record but have regular assessments uh, which then are linked to possible uh, sanctions uh, on all member states and I think that that could help. Um, and then secondly one of the key issues here was, was leadership. Um, yeah, and you're right, the, the originally Franco-German leadership doesn't work no longer as it used to be in a larger union, in a much more diverse union. And for a while, of course, you know that we had this idea about the Weimar Triangle, taking the Polish on board, and I think that is definitely important when we think about the future of Europe uh, to include the Eastern European voice. Um, 
even though it's a very difficult uh, one. It doesn't have to be the Weimar tri um, Triangle again, but we have to think about how to make leadership more uh, inclusive here um, for taking on board more voices from different regions um, and also uh, smaller and larger member states. But the, the larger member states certainly have still a key role in thinking about innovations, uh, making proposals um, and uh, trying to get the smaller member states uh, on board here. So I very much hope for more leadership from the German side. Uh, but I'm very, very sceptical about that, given okay. that uh, Chancellor Merkel at the moment is uh, uh, a much weaker person, much weaker leader than she, she used to be a couple of years ago. Well, I, let me just also um, add something on uh, leadership as that came out into questions. And I agree with everything that uh, Gabriella uh, has said there. Um, I suppose I, we could raise the question, given that the EU is dependent on collective leadership and is only ever going to work with collective leadership, whether it's taking on tasks where, in the event of crises, it cannot deliver the necessary collective leadership to solve them. This might be the debate, if, this might be an argument you wanted to put forward if you were arguing that the EU should concentrate on a single market. I'm not particularly making that point, or making that argument, but uh, e ele um, leadership is going to be collective or it's not going to exist. You can have those initiatives that you talked about, but certainly in the EU of uh, 28 or 27, uh, expecting the Franco-German tandem to be as effective as it was in the mm -hmm. 90s uh, is uh, for the birds, in my opinion. Um, we also, if we step back and think of it in sort of political theory terms, we also need to recognise that across the EU there are different traditions between a more adversarial type of leadership, okay, that you've got in, in the UK, but perhaps also France, and the more consensual approach. So how you look at this actually varies from where your, your perspective is. I do uh, believe that... Um, I do agree with you about the timidity of approach towards Poland and Hungary uh, and the setting of precedents there. And it may be that this idea of conditionality has to be continued into membership, that duties are taken on in receipt of funds by whoever the member states are uh, in not to undermine the principles of the European Union. I think that was a suggestion that mm -hmm. came in from um, Schultz, possibly, if I remember correctly. Um, just a final comment on um, the curriculum. I mean, great. Uh, that sounds a really good idea. Um, and, of course, some states have it more than others. Politische mm -hmm. Bildung in Germany... Um, it's not very present in Britain, maybe that <laughs> explains Brexit, I don't know. Um, but the point I'd make is that this isn't going to happen uh, if we allow the Eurosceptics to lead the argument mm -hmm. because they'll block it being mm -hmm. on the curriculum. So uh, that sort of highlights the nature of the debate that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So just to take the, the question of uh, four questions, so leadership, and I agree with you, Simon, collective leadership, but I remember a time in the good old days when Jacques Delors was president of the European Commission. He was a forceful, powerful personality, and he was leading the way, um, obviously with the help of the Germans uh, and the French. And, and then, since then, you've seen commission presidents coming in one weaker and weaker and weaker than the other. And, you know, I, I, I would really ideally love to see a European Commission which is strong but humble, if the two can go together. <laughs> um, you really need this collective leadership of the European Commission to stop acting like ministers and, and heads of state. I think they're not. They, we know they're not. The European Commission is not a national government. And more and more, they have the trappings of it. They behave like that. 
And I think to be really engaged in our conversations, the commissioners, um, if they're 28 or who, however the number, really need to become part of the conversation, not just giving speeches uh, and then leaving. And I, I, I can tell you, in, in Brussels, it's really um, heartbreaking sometimes to see how little the engagement is really at the higher level. Needs to be more inclusive also. I mean, you know, we cannot once again have Martin Weber, uh, in, in, one of the Spitzenkandidaten, and another sort of, you know, white middle-aged man, sorry, I don't mean to be insulting, but uh, uh, at the European Commission, and another one at the Commission, at the Parliament, and then you have the Council of Ministers. This is, you know, bank. seriously central bank, a committee of regions. I mean, seriously, this is not the way Europe looks. This is not the way Europe works um, and, and feels and thinks. Uh, we, need to, we need to get that. So um, really, I, I think that's very, very important that we, and you know, not go for the, for the weakest link when we nominate <coughs> our commission presidents uh, in these haggling. So get a little bit more in tune with what's happening in the rest of the world and inside Europe as well, member states. Timidity about, I mean, that is something that, you know, um, really concerns us, all of us here. Uh, Didier Reinders, the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, has come up with an excellent uh, idea of a, a peer review. I mean, like you have it for the Eurozone, the deficits and the budgets, he has the same thing for rule of law. And, you know, where is it at? Still being debated by, by the Council of Ministers. And hardly anyone talks about it. But Didier is right. I mean, that is the way forward, as you said. You know, once you join the EU, once you're a member state, yeah, well, hello, you can do what you like. It has to be different. Um, about school curricula as well, I mean, I, I do agree with you. I think that's very important. Once again, you know, uh, it can be done nationally. It doesn't have to be done in Brussels for the rest of, uh, of the world, uh, of Europe, but it, can, it should be done. We should be taught. And that brings me to the final point that Fino has raised uh, about the peace narrative. You know, we are so comfortable and we're so complacent in our peace here in Europe. On our borders, <laughs> there is wreckage, devastation, destruction. We're seeing the people coming in, fleeing those areas of war and destruction. And we're saying, no, the peace narrative isn't uh, credible or relevant, doesn't resonate with our citizens mm -hmm. anymore. So, you know, once again, the illiberal thinking, the populist illiberal thinking dominating the agenda. And voices that come out are, are, that are sort of seen as too soft to deal with this world. Well, that's where the slippery slope lies. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. that's where the slippery slope lies. So um, before I, um, I would like you to thank uh, the panel, uh, I want to do two things. Uh, the first um, of these is I want to tell you where to get the best coffee. Ah. Uh, at the university and also in the city. So the best place in the university is just across the car park uh, in the edge, uh, so-called edge, it's the arts uh, and music uh, center. Uh, they have the best coffee on campus. Um, the second is, um, or, or rather the, the other uh, best place is called Kelowna and Smalls uh, in the city. Go to Kelowna and Smalls, best coffee uh, in, the, in the city. Some of you will be writing this down. Not everybody drinks coffee I, or cares. Uh, anyway, uh, the final thing is, is I want to, uh, I want to thank the uh, James Madison uh, Charitable Trust who's, helped, who's sponsored this plenary. And uh, many of the conversations that we're having today are the exact same conversations that um, uh, James Madison and, and others were having in the Federalist Papers uh, a very long time ago. Uh, so uh, if you've not read Federalist Paper 51, 11, and 7, I recommend it. Um, the, uh, the, the final thing uh, that I want to do is say, can you help me thank uh, the panel? Thank you. Mm -hmm.